Hello, everyone, and welcome to this final plenary lecture at the 10th Global Young Scientist Summit. My name is Johnson Goh, and I'm from ASTAR Singapore, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, his professor, Stuart Parkin. Stuart Parkin is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics in Halle, Germany. He's also an Alexander von Humboldt professor at the Martin Luther University in Halle Wittenberg. His research interests include spintronic materials and devices for advanced sensor, memory, and logic applications, oxide thin film heterostructures, topological metals, exotic superconductors, and cognitive devices. Parkin's discoveries in spintronics enable a more than 10,000-fold increase in the storage capacity of magnetic disk drives. Now, for his work, which enabled the big data world of today, Parkin was awarded the Millennium Technology Award from the Technology Academy Finland in 2014, and most recently, the King Faisal Prize for Science 2021 for his research into three distinct classes of spintronic materials uh, for memories. Parkin is a fellow or member of the Royal Society of London, Royal Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, the German National Academy of Science, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Indian Academy of Sciences, and TWAS Academy of Sciences for developing the world in the world um, these spintronic devices, and he has received numerous awards from all around the world. So, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Parkin. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here and delighted to tell you something about my research. And I want to tell you something in particular about a novel technology that we've been working on for some time that could replace many of the technologies used today to store digital data. And this is something I called the magnetic racetrack memory. So I'd like today to tell you something about memory on the racetrack. So if we move to the first foil, let me just point out, this is uh, my current institute in Germany. I moved there five years ago from sunny California, and now I'm very happy to be able to take uh, delight in the seasons of the year. This is my institute that I photographed last year in the winter, where in Germany there can be quite a lot of snow. Nevertheless, the Max Planck Institute is a great place to carry out exploratory research. Uh, the Max Planck Society is one of the leading research organizations in Europe with more than 20,000 employees and 84 independent institutes of which this is one. My own institute is interested in developing novel materials that can impact future technologies. So I want to take you back 550 years to a very important technological revolution that took place beginning in Germany uh, by a uh, uh, technologist and engineer Johannes Gutenberg. He invented what is called the movable type press. Before his work, before his discoveries, uh, information was stored in the form of just written words on pieces of paper. And this meant that it was limited to small numbers of individuals. With his development of the uh, printing press, uh, books could be printed uh, more than a single copy at a time. And this enabled in information to spread widely and led uh, for the next several hundred years, if you like, the age of enlightenment, when information could be accessed by uh, people by going to read books in libraries. Well, this uh, era of analog printing lasted 500 years. But 50 years ago, the IBM Corporation in California, in San Jose, invented a new technology for storing not analog data, but digital data in the form of zeros and ones. And the information was encoded in the direction of magnetization of small magnetic bits that were encoded in a thin magnetic film deposited on the surface of a disk. Today, that disk will be made of glass, and the disk is rotated mechanically, and a device is moved over the surface of that disk for reading and writing that magnetic information. So over the last 50 years, the storage capacities of a magnetic disk drive has increased by a billion times, and the cost has gone down by even more than that per bit. 
But the last four orders of magnitude improvement were due to a spintonic device that I invented 30 years ago. And I want to tell you a little bit about the physics behind that device, a spin valve, in the next few foils. Uh, in this uh, view graph, you can see at the, uh, you can see, well, <laughs> you can't, on the bottom left, you can see a magnetic force microscope image of a series of these bits. The black and white regions uh, correspond to magnetization pointing out of or into the plane of the magnetic media on this disk. And over the years, the, the objective was to shrink these magnetic regions to smaller and smaller dimensions so that more information could be encoded in a single disk, leading to today's disk drives that have terabyte capacities. Now, the fact that today, 70% of all digital information is stored in these magnetic disk drives, even today. And this is, uh, means that if you look inside the, what we call the cloud today, you would see millions of disk drives in addition to millions of computing cores. And the fact that this digital information can be accessed by modern day communications is the basis for some of the most valuable corporations today, like Facebook and Google. But moreover, this data is a very important commodity that allows us, for example, to make scientific discoveries more rapidly than was possible before. And this, uh, we could look at, for example, this very nice paper published in Science 10 years ago at how the world's storage capacity has evolved over this two decade period of time. And what these authors looked at was how that information was encoded. The orange corresponds to devices that are essentially analog, like books, newspapers, and so on. And the blue corresponds to devices that innately store digital information in the forms of zeros and ones. So shown here, for example, 10 years ago, uh, some much information was stored in CD compact disks. That no longer is the case. And if we look today, we would see that 100% or 70% of all digital data is stored in the form of magnetic disk drives. And the rest of the data is stored still in digital form. So we've gone from the analog era of Gutenberg to the digital data of today. We've gone from books in libraries to magnetic disk drives in the cloud so that uh, information is much more readily available than before. And that has enabled us to expand both our scientific and technological frontiers. I want to say a little bit then about what is spintronics and what is this spintronic device. And so I just remind you that today's computing and memory technologies uh, use the electrons charge. In a transistor, a switch, we turn on and off currents of electrons by applying voltages. This is the basically the essential computing element of today. On the other hand, we can build memory devices by capacitors in which we store certain numbers of electrons. This would be, for example, a flash memory. But the electron has another property called spin. It's a quantum mechanical property that was discovered 100 years ago. And the spin is of two flavors. It points up or it points down. So it's innately digital. And we can, uh, over the last 30 years, we've developed a field of spintronics in which we can create, manipulate, and detect currents of spin polarized electrons to make novel devices for memory and potentially computing applications. I'm only going to talk here about memory and storage applications. So I want to just give you a brief insight into the device that makes possible the super high storage capacities of magnetic disk drives today. And it's a device that can read tiny magnetic fields. So let's take a metallic conductor like copper. If we introduce a current from a battery, then there will be equal numbers of electrons with spin up and spin down. They equally carry the current. So the current is innately has no spin, net spin polarization. Now, of course, the scattering of these electrons determines the resistance of this material. Now, on the other hand, if we take a ferromagnetic material, this is colored blue to represent a blue direction. When we introduce current from a battery within a very short uh, length scale, the mean free path, the electrons will be scattered. And the electrons which are polarized with their spin up or polarized with their spin down as compared to the magnetization direction that sets the direction of the electron spin will be scattered at different rates. In this particular material, the spin up electrons are scattered strongly, while the spin down electrons are scattered only weakly. And this means that the current in this material is carried by electrons largely of one spin polarization. This again was a concept that was developed only shortly after the concept of the spin was uh, evolved. <clears throat> 
Now let's take this device. In this cartoon, you can see two magnetic layers, a red layer and a blue layer, where the color represents the direction in which the magnetic moments point. And these two magnetic layers are separated by an ultra thin layer of copper, which is a metallic material. So now when we introduce uh, current from a battery, the red layer will support electrons which uh, have their red polarization polarized up, and the blue layer will support electrons which have their polarization in the opposite direction. And because this is a metallic system, electrons from the red layer will cross this copper layer and then be scattered in the blue layer, and vice versa. So innately, this system where the moments are polarized of the two magnetic layers are antiparallel will have a high resistance. The electrons will always be scattered strongly somewhere in the layered system. On the other hand, if we rotate the two magnetic layers, so they're both blue, they both had the same direction of magnetization, now the blue electrons can be weakly scattered everywhere in the system, and this leads to a lower resistance. So we've built now what I call the spin valve. And this spin valve then is a device whose resistance depends on the directions of these two magnetic moments. Low resistance when the moments in the sandwich are parallel, and high resistance when they're antiparallel. And we can then use this to build a magnetic field sensor. If you put the device in magnetic fields, they will cause rotation of the magnetic moments. Let's say if the two moments were antiparallel, uh, then we would change the resistance. And so fundamentally, this is a magnetoresistive device. If we make a multi-layer of ultra-thin, let's say, cobalt layers separated by copper layers, uh, and we design a structure in which those magnetic moments in the superlattice are anti-parallel to one another in zero magnetic field, as shown in this cartoon, when we apply a magnetic field, then we can cause the magnetic field to rotate all the magnetic moments in the superlattice so they become parallel to one another. And this leads to a drop in resistance. Now, this is called giant magneto resistance, which was first observed by Albert Fert and Peter Grunberg in super lattices formed from iron and chromium layers made by molecular beam epitaxy. And they observed this phenomenon of very low temperatures and these same very large magnetic fields. Here you can see the field required to change the resistance of this super lattice is 30,000 ersteds. Although in this case, using cobalt and copper material I discovered, you can see these effects even at room temperature and above, making them technologically useful. However, these fields are a thousand times or 10,000 times higher than the magnetic fields in a magnetic disk drive, which we would use to detect a magnetic bit. So this is the reason why the spin valve device can be designed to detect tiny magnetic fields. We can make it responsive, not to fields of 10,000 ersteds, but to fields of one ersted. And this is what I did. And one of the uh, uh, reasons I could do this was I demonstrated that in a super lattice or a multi-layer, as you change the thickness of the copper layer, as shown here, on the, say on the left-hand side, you can see this plots the, the magnitude of this giant magnetoresistive phenomenon. In other words, what is the percentage change in resistance of the super lattice when the moments in the super lattice have their neighboring moments antiparallel versus parallel? And in this uh, plot, you can see that the giant magnetoresistive value at room temperature oscillates from large values, for example, uh, in the 100 direction of copper, 60%. When you change the copper layer thickness by just a few angstroms, then the giant magnetoresistance effects disappears. There's no change in resistance. When you increase the copper thickness a little bit more, then you establish the giant magnetoresistance effect again. So the magnitude of this effect oscillates as a function of increasing separation of the magnetic layers here through copper. And this is something that I discovered and was the first to demonstrate. And it also showed, as in this case here, depending upon the crystal orientation of the super lattice, whether 100 or 110 or 111, the period of this oscillation varies. And without going into too many details, the period of the oscillation in the magnitude of the GMR is reflective of the electronic structure of this material. In fact, these periods correspond to wave vectors that span the Fermi surface of copper in those particular directions. And these oscillations are actually reflective of an oscillation in the magnetic coupling between the successive magnetic layers that depends on the thickness of the copper layer.
As I said, these are all at room temperature, so it makes these effects super interesting and useful. And just to explain briefly what gives rise to this magnetic long-range oscillatory coupling is a spin polarization of the electron gas in the system. So as shown in this cartoon, if you introduce a magnetic spin into a non-magnetic -mag metallic host, then the electrons will try to screen that magnetic impurity. But because it's magnetic, the response itself is spin polarized. And the spin polarization of that electron gas can then lead to a long range magnetic coupling. So as shown in the bottom part of this foil, if you imagine two magnetic films shown here as blue and red, they were separated by copper, the spin polarization in the copper has a period of its polarization oscillatory behavior, which is reflective of the electronic structure, cannot be changed. So depending upon the separation of these two magnetic layers, the second magnetic layer will either see a spin polarization of the electron gas, which is in the same direction as the first magnetic layer, or in the opposite direction. And this leads to an oscillatory long-range exchange coupling between these magnetic layers, which is useful for spin engineering interesting structures in super lattices. And again, this is something that I was the first to show and demonstrate. And also, I demonstrated that actually, this is a property of nearly all elements in the periodic table, all metallic elements, all the transition metals, whether they're 3D, 4D, or 5D, and all the noble metals, copper, silver, and gold. Each of these materials has a distinctive response to a magnetic impurity or a magnetic layer, which gives rise to this long-range magnetic coupling. And it varies in a highly systematic way as we fill the D-bands in these 5D, 4D, and 3D metals. And you can see from this plot of the strength of this long-range magnetic coupling mediated by this spin density wave that the strength is strongest as you increase the D-band filling. Now, why is this useful? It turns out it's actually critically important uh, because we can use it to design magnetic structures that would otherwise not be possible. And so if we look on the left side of this cartoon, you can see a schematic of a spin valve structure. The red layer at the top is a magnetic material whose moments are pointing to the right. And then the yellow in between is copper and the blue uh, dots correspond to a magnetic layer with its moments pointing to the left. And underneath, we use an antiferromagnetic material to set the state of that blue layer moment so that it is unresponsive to external magnetic fields. I don't want to discuss that. It's a, a, a property called exchange bias. And this, again, is a, is a property that I propose we use to build this spin valve sensing device. However, on useful uh, dimensions that for a recording head, the device has to be on the nanometer scale. 10, 20 nanometers in size. And this means that the magnetic layers, shown as red and blue, the magnetic poles at the edges of the device give rise to dipole fields. And these dipole fields on nanometer scale are very strong. And this means, that's why I've drawn this device showing the red and blue layers are antiparal. The dipole fields will automatically align the two magnetic, magnetic layers antiparal because of the strength of this dipole field. So we have to find a way to eliminate these dipole fields to make useful devices that can respond to tiny magnetic fields. And again, this is a proposal I made. I said we could build an artificial anti-ferromagnetic layer, as shown on the right, in which the blue layer is replaced with a sandwich of a blue and red layer separated by these pink dots, which is an ultra-thin layer of ruthenium, which gives rise to a this long-range oscillatory coupling, but in this case, the thickness of the ruthenium, it turns out, when it's very thin, gives rise to a very strong anti-ferromagnetic coupling. So we can build a reference magnetic layer whose net magnetic moment is zero, but the interface with copper is magnetized. And it turns out, I also showed, that the phenomenon of giant magnet resistance is dominated by spin-dependent scattering at the interfaces between copper in this case, and the neighboring magnetic layers, which would be cobalt. So by spin engineering and creating an artificial antiferromagnet, by building structures with, the, with these layers, each of them is just one or two atomic layers thick, we can build a structure which is unresponsive to these dipole fields, but then can be responsive to external magnetic fields.
And the very first uh, device that was introduced into a magnetic recording head by IBM used exactly this structure that I invented, a synthetic antiferromagnet stabilized by exchange bias with an antiferromagnet, a copper layer, and interface layers designed to optimize the magnitude of the giant magneto resistance. And basically, we design a structure in which the two magnetic layers are actually have their moments opposed orthogonally to one another. And when in the presence of the stray magnetic fields, the fringing fields from magnetic bits in the magnetic layer, in the magnetic disk drive, the two oriented antiparallel, these domain walls will have fringing fields which are detected by this recording head. And this device uh, that I just described can uh, detect these tiny fringing fields, which are 10,000 times smaller than any other device uh, before this device. So Spintronics was able to build, uh, using these concepts of long-range oscillatory coupling, interfacial spin-dependent scattering, the synthetic antiferromagnet, and the proper materials, cobalt and copper, could operate a device at room temperature that was 10,000 times more sensitive to tiny magnetic fields than any other device, and that's still true today. So this enabled then, within just a few years, the uh, area of these magnetic bits to be shrunk by a thousand times and thereby to increase the storage capacity of a magnetic disk drive by many orders of magnitude. This was the first success of a uh, Spintronics. Now it turns out the same device where we replace copper by an insulating material turns out to have larger values of magnetic resistance. The physics now has nothing to do with giant magnetic resistance and spin-dependent scattering. It's due to spin-dependent tunneling. So in this cartoon, you can see two red layers, two magnetic layers with their moments parallel, separated by an ultra-thin insulating layer, shown in gray. And this will be approximately one nanometer thick. Now, when you extract current from the surface of a ferromagnet into an insulator, it turns out, because the material is magnetic, this means there are more electrons with their spins oriented in one direction than the opposing direction. This means automatically the current is spin polarized. Moreover, by choosing that uh, insulating layer properly, the insulating layer itself, even though it's non-magnetic, can further spin filter the current. So that the current, which is tunneling across the insulating barrier from one layer to the next, can be up to more than 90% spin polarized. In other words, the electrical current consists 90% of electrons of majority spin polarization. The opposing magnetic layer, if it has the same magnetic orientation as the first one, can accept those electrons. There are empty states of the same spin polarization into which those electrons can tunnel. The tunneling process itself is ultra fast and the spin, polar spin orientation of the electron is preserved. However, if we change the orientation of that second moment, as shown in the bottom cartoon, so it's now in the blue direction, you can essentially switch off the current because now there are no longer many states of the, of the polarization of the tunneling electron. And so there are no states into which it can tunnel and the tunneling current is reduced. Today, the difference in the tunneling current for these two orientations for interesting tunnel junction devices uh, can be several times. So the tunneling magnetic resistance can exceed several hundred percent, even at room temperature. The metallic spin valve devices, even at room temperature in uh, the sandwich devices, the typical change in resistance is only 20%, but that still made them extremely useful to detect tiny magnetic bits. So the tunneling magnetic resisted device using exactly the same spin engineering principles I discussed earlier uh, are today the devices that are used in magnetic disk drives to read information. But they also form, could form, another type of memory, and this again is the proposal that I and some colleagues made in 1995, that we could use that same tunneling junction as a non-volatile element. The information is simply stored as the direction of magnetic moment. If it's red direction on the right, or if it's blue, one corresponds to a zero, another corresponds to a one, and we can measure the uh, state uh, as a non-volatile state simply by the current, the magnitude of the current that is passed through the device. If it's a large current, then it's red. If it's a small current, it's blue. And we can do that very quickly on the scale of one nanosecond uh, for typical devices. So in this cartoon, you can see these gray regions are the magnetic tunnel junctions and they're interposed between two sets of 
uh, copper lines in conventional CMOS technology. And now uh, we can pass a current through a device from a word line through the bit line and detect whether the device passes, sustains a large current or a small current, a zero or a one. And at the same time, we originally proposed we would simply pass currents along these word and bit lines to generate local magnetic fields to set the state of the magnetic tunnel junction. Today, we're going to use a totally different concept to change the magnetic state, to write the magnetic state by simply passing a greater current through the device. And that current carries spin angular momentum because the current is spin polarized. And that spin polarized current generates torques that can itself change the direction and set the state of these magnetic tunneling junction bits. With this concept of a magnetic random access memory, well, we proposed in 1995 when, um, when it's uh, when the devices, the tunneling junction devices at that time, had tiny tunneling magnetic resistance values of no more than 10%. And moreover, their resistance, typical resistance values, were 100 million times too high to be useful. In order to reduce the resistance to useful values, the insulating layer has to be incredibly thin so that the electrons can readily tunnel across it. And that's something that we demonstrated uh, a few years after we proposed this device. So on the one hand, these tunneling junction devices, properly spin engineered, can respond to tiny magnetic fields and can be used as the very sensitive uh, detectors of magnetic bits and magnetic disk drives. And on the other hand, we could use them to build a very interesting non-volatile magnetic random access memory. Now it took us several years uh, to uh, prove not only find the materials, but to prove this concept. And uh, I'm going to show you in the next chart the time scale for this. But eventually, we did build, a few years ago, uh, when I was at IBM, a 16 megabit fully functioning magnetic random access memory. And it has these attributes, extremely fast reading and writing, high performance, good endurance. Nevertheless, compared to the magnetic disk drives, it would be 100 times more expensive per bit. This is why magnetic disk drives are still useful today. But I wanted to just give you some idea of the time scale. Typically, uh, from a material to an application, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States carried out a study a few years ago showing that it typically takes about 20 years, a long time from the discovery of a new material to its uh, application. In this case, uh, my, invent my discoveries in 1988-1991 of these uh, oscillatory interlay coupling, the materials interface spin event scattering, and the synthetic antiferromagnet, they were used in 1997 by IBM in the first spin valve uh, recording head. It only took just a few years. Um, and later on, 10 years later, the, the physics underlying the recording heads change from a metallic system to the tunneling junction device, but with exactly the same, uh, otherwise the same structures. Today, magnetic disk drives is a technology in some sense at the end of their roadmap. It's really very tough to further increase the capacity of magnetic disk drives for several reasons. So we need an alternative. Magnetic random access memory, you can see we proposed in 1995, and yet it was only uh, two years ago that Samsung and later at TSMC announced it was possible to buy from them in their factories high performance foundry uh, magnetic random access memory because this memory has greater performance than, for example, embedded DRAM that it currently is replacing. So it's taken, as you can see, 25 years from uh, the proposal to its application. This is more typical of uh, complex materials. So, nevertheless, uh, magnetic random access memory, because it uses, stores one bit essentially per transistor, nevertheless will never have the density of a magnetic disk drive, approximately 100 times different. So I proposed uh, in 2002 a third spintronic device. I called it a magnetic racetrack, which I think is super interesting. And over the last few years, we've demonstrated it's even better than when I proposed it in 2002. And the concept then, it's very different from all existing memory technologies and storage technologies today. As you can see in this schematic cartoon, the idea would be we would build a racetrack from a uniform magnetic material in the third dimension. 
And then as you can see here, the blue and red regions correspond to different directions of magnetization perpendicular to this wrist track. But you can also see in the cartoon, what we do is we move the information which is encoded in the domain walls between the blue and red region. We, we move that information around the racetrack by passing current pulses into the racetrack. And these current pulses, if they're spin polarized, will develop spin torques onto the domain walls, which can move them. And my proposal was all the domain walls should move at the same speed together synchronously. So the information encoded as the presence or absence of domain walls can be brought to individual reading and writing devices built into the racetrack itself. In this way, uh, because we would have 100 domain walls per racetrack, we would have 100 times the capacity, let's say, of a magnetic random access memory in the same size chip. This would enable us to have the capacity of a magnetic hard disk drive, but this device would be totally solid state without any moving parts and would be a million times faster to access the first bit and, uh, and would be totally reliable because there are no moving parts. So this is uh, very interesting conceptually. And I uh, just wanted to show you uh, when we first proposed this device, then as I said, uh, it hadn't yet been demonstrated that a series of domain walls could be manipulated with the same current pulse. And this is something we showed a few years after I proposed, made this proposal. And in this cartoon, this is how it would work. Uh, just as I said before, if you take current from a battery with equal numbers of spin up and spin down electrons in a magnetic material magnetized in the blue direction here, the current becomes spin polarized due to spin dependent scattering. But because an electron with a spin has a spin angular momentum, and angular momentum is a conserved quantity, as you can see in the schematic cartoon below, in a racetrack formed from this orange material, a domain wall uh, is shown here between two orange regions magnetized to the right and to the left. Then a conduction electron passing through this domain wall uh, with a spin in a given direction as it crosses the domain wall, it would adiabatically change its orientation as it follows the magnetization within the wall and would deliver a quantum of spin angular momentum to the domain wall. Because it's conserved, this would lead to the rotation of the direction of one magnetic moment, essentially one electron per magnetic moment. So with enough current of spin polarized electrons, we can cause the moments in the domain wall to rotate and the domain wall to move. And this is something that then we were first demonstrated in 2008 uh, and in a paper we published in Science where we showed in a wire we could create a series of domain walls, we could pass current pulses, move all the domain walls in the same direction and prove the fundamental concept of this racetrack. We could current control the presence of a series of domain walls in nano wires and therefore uh, this proved this concept I proposed six years earlier was valid. And if you like, this is the first edition of this magnetic racetrack memory. I don't really have time to discuss the evolution, but over the last 10 years, we've evolved this memory on racetrack, if you like, through four editions, four stages. And these are some of our own work. And of course, there's many papers from other groups around the world. But we moved from racetrack 1.0 in which the racetrack was formed from a very soft magnetic material, just as I've discussed, because in those soft magnetic materials, the current is strongly spin polarized. We then moved to, in racetrack 2.0, to a super lattice of cobalt and nickel, in which the broken symmetry causes the magnetization to be perpendicular and the domain walls to be 100 times narrower. Nevertheless, the domain walls move with current under the same principle that the current is spin polarized in the material and develops spin transfer torques onto the domain walls. In racetrack 3.0, the racetrack itself again is formed from a super lattice of ultra thin cobalt and nickel layers, but is deposited on this yellow layer, which is a heavy metal. And this uses a very interesting concept that when you pass current, through a non-magnetic metal, which has strong spin orbit coupling, that charge current will turn into a spin current that flows in a direction perpendicular to the charge current with a spin polarization 
which is in a direction perpendicular to both the charge current and the spin current. So essentially, this converts the charge current into a pure spin current that carries spin angular momentum, and this can diffuse into the magnetic layer and apply torques onto the domain walls and cause them to move. And it turns out it can cause them to move much more efficiently than in racetrack 1.0. And finally, we discovered just five years ago an entirely new racetrack, which is based on this synthetic anti-ferromagnet that uh, I first proposed 25 years ago for spin valves to eliminate the dipole fields. And it turns out that's also super important in racetrack because the dipole fields emanating from one magnetic region to another will cause interactions both within and between distinct racetracks. I want to briefly discuss that in a moment. So there are essentially four or five important ingredients to make this racetrack work. First of all, we make the race drag from, as you see on the top right, these green and blue layers correspond to atomically thin layers of cobalt and nickel. Each layer is just a few angstroms thick, and the whole race drag is only one nanometer thick. It's grown on a platinum underlayer, shown here as orange. And the platinum underlayer not only gives rise to this spin hall effect, where current passed through that material generates a spin current, but it also gives rise to a very interesting exchange interaction, which is called a diliginsky maria exchange interaction that causes the magnetic moments in the magnetic layer on top of the platinum layer to want to be oriented perpendicular to one another. But it's a very special, special interaction in that it's a vector exchange and that uh, perpendicular orientation of the moments actually also has a chirality. So you can see uh, in this cartoon, when we switch from a red region in the racetrack magnetized up to a blue region pointing down, the magnetization will rotate in a plane perpendicular to the domain wall, such that as shown here in the cartoon by the green arrow, the magnetization in that domain wall will point to the right. But when in the same material, the magnetization rotates from a blue to a red direction, then the green arrow in the middle of the domain will, will point to the left. And the basic diliginsky maria interfacial interaction causes the domain walls in this perpendicularly magnetized cobalt-nickel layer to both be what is called a nailed domain wall and to have a chirality. The chirality can only be changed by changing that orange material. If we change it from platinum to tungsten, for example, the chirality will be different, but the chirality will be the same in all the domain walls. And this is the only reason why all those domain walls will then move in the same direction when we pass current pulses through that platinum layer, and which generates this spin hole effect. Now, other elements of making racetrack very important are uh, that the platinum typically will become itself slightly magnetic by a proximity-induced magnetization. And this synthetic antiferromagnetic concept is very important. So we will build the racetrack not from a single cobalt, nickel cobalt super lattice, but from two. I just want to remind you then this about this Dilizinski Maria exchange, uh, which also leads to chiral domain walls and more complex non-collinear spin textures, which if there's time, I would like to discuss. On the, right, on the left side here, you can see the basic uh, exchange mechanism, which is called Heisenberg exchange, causes in some materials the magnetic moments of the individual atoms, such as in cobalt, nickel, iron, to be oriented parallel to one another. And this is a Heisenberg exchange. In some materials, that exchange can be negative, and the moments will be oriented, no, not parallel, but antiparallel. This is an antiferromagnet, for example, nickel oxide. However, as I said, there are some materials where the symmetry is broken, no longer central symmetric, where with strong spin orbit coupling, this leads to the magnetic moments wanting to be not parallel, as in a ferromagnet, or antiparallel, as in an antiferromagnet, but being perpendicular to one another in a helical or chiral fashion. And this then leads to, for example, as shown in the bottom, spin spiral states in some material, and if there's time to discuss, schemionic uh, objects like this. But in the domain walls I've shown, it leads to the, the, the fact that they have a chiral nail structure. 
And this is shown here. I've just mentioned that. So this is the very important point that the domain walls in this system are not only very narrow, they're only a few nanometers wide, but they are also have this chiral structure. Now, uh, the spin hole effect I mentioned is shown schematically here. So of course, you're all very familiar with a conventional hall effect. You pass a current into a material in the presence of a magnetic field, and this will cause the electrons under Lorentz forces to be moved to the left or to the right, and this leads to the hall voltage across the material. But it turns out in some materials without any magnetic field and without any magnetization, you pass a yellow current here into, let's say, platinum, and you will generate a current of spin polarized electrons that flows in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction around the current. And this spin polarized current can be extracted from the surface into a magnetic material to provide spin orbit torques. And it was only recently that it was realized that in metal systems, this spin hole angle, the ratio of the magnitude of the spin current to that of the charge current could be significant. Just 10 years ago, it was believed in metals that this spin hole uh, effect, the conversion of pure charge current to pure spin currents was of the order of one thousandth, very, very tiny. But in the last few years, it's been demonstrated by ourselves and by others that the magnitude of these spin hole angles, the efficiency of conversion of charge to spin current can be extremely large, so that today we have materials where this efficiency is nearly one. In other words, every electron that passes through a material like platinum or other materials would be converted to a pure current of a single spin polarized electron. And this is extremely important technologically. It turns out there's no time to discuss uh, our work and others on extremely large spin hole effects from non-magnetic triangular antiferromagnets and Kagome magnets, which are super interesting. Nevertheless, then, and I mentioned already that the neighboring domains lead to dipole fields, which cause interactions between magnetic bits in a racetrack. We have to eliminate them. And uh, I mentioned earlier then this concept of a synthetic antiferromagnet where an upper and lower racetrack, otherwise identical, uh, mirror, one is a mirror image of the other through, in this case, I hope you can see this ultra thin ruthenium spacer layer that will give rise to a very strong anti-ferromagnetic coupling. Where it turns out the chirality of these nail domain walls is preserved from one racetrack to the other. But in the end, you have a racetrack where there is no net magnetization anywhere in the racetrack, therefore no dipole fields. And nevertheless, when we did this, we discovered that uh, current pulses passed across this domain wall would move it uh, five times more efficiently than in an identical structure where the ruthenium thickness is changed by two angstroms and the coupling is ferromagnetic. So this is shown on the right-hand side when the magnetization in the upper and lower racetracks are exactly anti-parallel to one another and of the same magnitude. The efficiency of the motion, the velocity of these domain walls under the same current pulse intensity would be five times larger. And this led us to show that we could move domain walls in these systems at speeds exceeding one kilometer per second. And this leads to the possibility of creating devices that can operate on 100 picosecond timescales, which is faster than any conventional memory technology today. So this is very exciting. And this just shows you some uh, images of racetracks in the laboratory. Now these uh, racetracks are too wide to be technologically useful. They're two microns wide. These are 50 microns long, but we can image them optically. The optical resolution is about 0.6 microns. Uh, nevertheless, by applying current pulses, we can then image the structure of 20 domain walls, apply current pulse, and we can see them move synchronously backwards and forwards. In this case, in a single racetrack at speeds of 300 meters per second. But in the bottom, you can see a synthetic anti-ferromagnetic racetrack where these domain walls are moving at one kilometer per second. So we're just showing you a series of images after we've applied ultra short current pulses. And so basically this is a very interesting racetrack memory technology where using synthetic antiferromagnet 
magnetic racetracks, we can make technologically relevant devices. And we've demonstrated in my laboratory in Germany that we can shrink the width of these racetracks to technologically relevant sizes of the order of 15 nanometers. And it turns out the speed of the domain walls is unchanged for the same intensity of the current pulses. This makes this magnetic racetrack extremely useful. Now, I wanted to also mention that to build these devices, we built in Germany uh, a series of deposition systems. On the left-hand side, you can see an orange long tube. Uh, this is, these are heating tapes on an ultra-high vacuum tube, 15 meters long, and we can automatically transfer substrates on which we deposit these racetrack films between different types of deposition systems that are uh, specifically designed uh, to use different methods for depositing these ultra-thin layers. And again, there's no time to discuss this, but we uh, have, for example, molecular beam epitaxy systems for depositing oxides and nitrides. We have a glove box for exfoliating 2D materials. And we have our own system, I call it Mango, which has up to 44 sputtering sources, magnetron and ion beam sources. And all these systems are designed so that the source materials uh, can be rapidly changed while the rest of the system continues to operate. So this is a, a very exciting development that we've uh, de developed over the last few years to enable us to accelerate our discovery of interesting atomically engineered uh, materials, both for spintronics and for superconducting applications and for other applications and science. Now, I don't know how much time there is left. <laughs> I'm losing track of the time. Uh, but uh, well, how much time do we have? Nobody knows, so I carry on. No. So I want to briefly discuss these magnetic skimions. And here I want to just turn to a very interesting family of compounds called Heusler compounds. Heusler compounds are a set of materials discovered several decades ago and uh, were of interest because uh, they involve no magnetic element, iron, cobalt, or nickel, rather manganese, and these materials were found to be ferromagnetic. They consist of four interpenetrating FCC face center cubic lattices. When the systems are magnetic, the lattice is distorted, becomes tetragonal, and this means that the magnetization will automatically be aligned along a particular direction, the tetragonal direction. And it turns out that these systems display very interesting spin textures, and I want to briefly discuss one of these. So this, we have Go time? Yes. Okay, so uh, then the structures I want to discuss are called skirmions and anti-skirmions. So maybe some of you are familiar with this. It's a relatively recent discovery, uh, which is that in a material like this Heusler compound, where the moments want to be parallel along a particular direction, it turns out that under some temperature and field regimes, instead, the magnetization will break up into an array of skirmionic objects. And the reason is, the reason is the same dielizinski maria exchange interaction that favors perpendicularly magnetized moments. This means that you can lower the energy of the system by forming, as shown in this cartoon, circular objects in which there is a domain wall in which the moments are aligned uh, perpendicular to one another. So the block skirmion has a structure in which if you go from the outside where the moments are out of the plane to the inside of the object where the moments are in the opposite direction, the moments will rotate from the up to the down direction in a plane which is tangential to the uh, surface of this object. It's called a block skirmion. The important point is that rotation of the magnetization will either be clockwise or anti-clockwise, depending upon the material system. Alternatively, one can form a nail skirmion, as on the right-hand side, where the magnetization rotates from an up direction to a down direction uh, in a plane along the radius. This is a nail skirmion, and basically, if we just looked at one along one radius, that would be exactly like the chiral domain walls in the racetrack that I briefly discussed. In both the block skirmion and the nail skirmion, is typically found in cubic systems, so that the circumference, the structure around the outer edge of these objects would be identical in all directions. However, it was theoretically predicted that in some systems with lower symmetry, you would, instead of seeing these two types of block and nail skirmions, you could find what is called an anti-skirmion. And in an anti-skirmion, the structure 
of the boundary between the outer material magnetized up and the inner material magnetized down changes around the circumference between nail and block-like segments. And every time you go from a nail to a block-like segment, the chirality changes. And this object was theoretically predicted, but was not had never been observed until we first observed it four years ago. And I want to show you how we observed it. We observed it using Lorentz transmission electron microscopy. So we basically take a single crystal of this material. We use focused ion beam milling techniques to cut a sliver, a lamella, out of this material, which is sufficiently thin that the electron beam can be transmitted through it. And that means it has to be, roughly speaking, below 200 nanometers thick. So we make this using focused ion beam milling. When the electrons then, high energy electrons, 300,000 volt electrons, are passed through this lamella, they will be subject to Lorentz forces from the magnetic component of the magnetization in the plane of the film. And this means that if we have a block skirmion, then in the Lorentz microscope, this will look like this, as you can see here, this white blob of increased electron intensity. On the other hand, the nail skirmion is invisible because the Lorentz forces cause the electrons to be uh, rotated around the circumference of the object. So there's no change in the intensity. On the other hand, the anti skirmion we calculated should show a image in the Lorentz microscope of these two white dots of increased intensity and two black dots of decreased electron intensity. And uh, we saw this, and I hope you can see in the top column to the left in part A, you can see such an object. This is, um, as again, this is obtained by passing a very high energy electron beam through an ultra thin lamella and detecting the, uh, the, 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 the electrons that are subject to the Lorentz forces in that lamina. Now it turns out you can also see in EFGH and the rest, you can see an array of these skirmions. And this is typically what you find. You find an hexagonal array of these skirmionic, anti-skirmionic objects. Well, this is the first time that these have been observed. That was just four years ago. Uh, we're very proud of our, this achievement. And I wanted then briefly to discuss, turns out these, these anti-skirmions have super interesting properties. Firstly, uh, if we take a series of Lorentz images in different magnetic fields, if you look at the row of images shown in B, on the left-hand side, you can see nothing. And that's because if we apply a big enough magnetic field, we will see all the magnetic moments actually become parallel again. And the Lorentz uh, imaging technique is only sensitive to changes in magnetization, not in magnetization. But as we reduce the field, you can see in these row B, you'll start to see, going from left to right, the anti skirmions appearing, until on the very right-hand side, you can actually see a different chiral spin texture, which is a helical spin texture, which is found in zero magnetic field. So in this case, the, the array of anti skirmions has disappeared, and instead, the system energy is stabilized by forming helical structures. And it turns out in these anti skirmion systems, the helical structure is directed along one of two perpendicular in-plane directions. And it turns out this helical structure has very interesting properties. Uh, maybe you can see here in this Lorentz micrograph on the right-hand side, you can see a series of white and black lines. These correspond to the in-plane component of the magnetization, changing from a right to a left direction. And you can see as we go from the right to the left in this lamina, the thickness of the lamina was designed to increase. And you can see that the spacing of these white lines increases. And it turns out the period of this helix increases, increases monotonically with thickness. And now if we switch to a different technique, we could use magnetic force microscopy to image these anti skirmions and helical structures in thicker lamella. We found that indeed the period of this oscillatory variation in magnetization increases monotonically with thickness, here up to 1.6 microns, and here even up to 4 microns. And you can see beautiful images of this helical structure in the magnetic force microscope. We're sensitive to the outer plane component. And if we change the magnetic field, you can see these white dots appearing, which are the anti skirmion objects. And the size of these objects also depends on the lamella thickness. And without going into any details, this is because of long range magnetic dipole fields that depend on the thickness of the lamella.
This had previously not been seen. Now, just to um, turns out, these spin textures, why skirmions and anti skirmions are interesting, is that the spin textures are topological. That means it's very difficult to distort them into any other structure. But we found in this system a, a new type of topological spin texture, these elliptical block skirmions, which who's oriented along two distinct crystal directions. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time, uh, and I also want to then, so I'm going to skip this part. Uh, the turns out by changing. Uh, temperature and field, we can change these uh, these objects. And I just wanted to briefly mention that recently we've discovered an even more interesting object, a fractional anti at the edges of these lamina. Hadn't been theoretically predicted, uh, but we believe this is a, a consequence of the interior structure through a bulk boundary correspondence. And these fractional anti only appear at the edges, and this has been confirmed theoretically by our collaborators at the University of Basel and the group of Daniel Loss. Uh, this work is not yet published. And so I'm going to skip this. Uh, this concept of two distinct topological spin textures in the same material could lead to racetracks where one topological spin texture, like an anti could represent one, and the elliptical block skirmion could represent zeros. And I think I have no time to talk about our work in 2D materials. I should summarize. So I want to summarize by saying that racetrack memory, where we store information in the presence or absence of chiral domain walls, uh, has become even more exciting in just the last few years, as we've developed and discovered in synthetic antiferromagnets new mechanisms that allow for these chiral domain walls to be moved 10 times more efficiently than was previously thought possible. And if we, we've already demonstrated, we can make racetracks that are just 50 nanometers wide with the same high efficiency of motion of the domain walls. This means we could build racetrack devices that could uh, replace magnetic disk drives with super high capacities. And at the same time, if we build a racetrack which is super short with a single domain wall, we could replace the fastest memory today, static random access memory, because this single domain wall racetrack can be ultra fast, 100 picoseconds. We've already demonstrated in the rotary below 400 picoseconds, would use much lower energy, would be non-volatile, and would have substantially increased density compared to today's static random access memory. In the last part of my talk, I briefly discussed the recent discoveries of ourselves of anti and elliptical block skirmions, these topological spin textures. And we've seen a whole variety of chiral spin textures in a range of compounds that I didn't have time to discuss, including uh, 2D materials that uh, today are of great interest. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. And here I wanted just to briefly acknowledge uh, some of the people involved in the work I've discussed, including my students and postdocs at the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics. Uh, some of the samples I uh, discussed were prepared by Claudia Felser and her collaborators in Dresden. And I also wanted to acknowledge our theoretical collaborations with Daniel Loss and his collaborators and Ingrid Matic at the Martin Luther University. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Parkin, for the very nice talk. Uh, I'd like to invite him to join me over here as we yeah, have a chat and uh, <coughs> try to answer some questions from the floor. Okay. Right? Yeah. Thanks, Stuart, for, really, for the very nice recount. Especially okay. enjoy your personal recount of how your um, ideas and spins uh, uh, and inventions in spintronics mm. right, led us from Gutenberg all the way to the cloud. Oh, yeah. And perhaps Thank you. now to the metaverse, right? And oh, yeah, definitely. Thanks for the nice uh, tutorial there as well. Uh, show us uh, all the spin physics behind. And uh, more ex exciting is the exhilarating ride that you brought us through in the last part um, mm. on racetrack memory, skirmions, anti skirmions. Yeah. I'm okay, sure, thank you very much. I'm sure our audience yeah, are looking forward to okay. more um, from you. They have questions mm. here. and. Uh, yeah. Okay. Quite a few of them. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll begin with the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Neil Kundu asks uh, Can the quantum effects of electron spin, example, superposition entanglement, be used to further improve memory storage capacity similar to quantum computing? What are your thoughts? Okay, so I think that question is, of course, spin is quantum mechanical. And there are ideas about using spin qubits 
uh, for quantum computing, which I think are very, very interesting. It's not something that we're doing ourselves. Actually, what we're doing is imagining ways of building cryogenic memories using concepts from Spintronics plus exotic superconductors, which we can build at interfaces between conventional superconductors and topological metals. Hi, thanks. Uh, Harutai has uh, this question. Uh, thank you for the great ideas and for his uh, for your sharing. He asks, uh, could you please advise what are the advantages of using racetrack memory compared to 3D NAND memories that we have now? Okay, so the advantages are actually NAND is a relatively slow technology to access the bits. So racetrack would enable us to write and read much faster than is possible in 3D NAND. Also, 3D NAND is a fantastic technology in which, uh, in order to avoid the problems with, as you, as you basically, it's a capacitance, a capacitor, which has a, stores a certain number of electrons. But as you shrink the dimensions, you cannot store enough electrons to enable multi-bit storage. And this is how you get to the very high storage capacities of 3D NAND. So Samsung invented a fantastic technique where they built layers of these memory cells and could access them all vertically. However, that technology relied on the flash memory cells, each cell being relatively large and relies on many, many layers. Well, this technology only works for up to 100 layers or so. And this means that it's impossible, not it's very difficult to increase the capacity further. You need to do something else. Magnetic racetrack memory, if you could build the vertical one, this would be super great. Very tough to build three-dimensional structures, although there's a lot of exciting research in that area in magnetic 3D systems, including our own work. But um, you could actually build racetrack again, one on top of each other. And it turns out you don't need many racetrack layers to compete with the highest capacity 3D NAND, but they would be much faster and would actually be more reliable because you rely on these magnetic elements. There's a huge numbers of advantages, mostly speed compared to 3D NAND. Oh, that's exciting to hear, thanks. Um, Jay has a question. I've encountered magnons when studying rotomodal light Hamiltonians. Can, can skirmion physics be studied using a similar model? What are some fundamental differences between these two? So I'm really not entirely sure what you mean, but nevertheless, it turns out that the properties of spin waves or magnons in chiral systems are extremely interesting compared to conventional systems. And in principle, because of the topological nature of these textures, you could imagine that the lifetime of these excitations would be longer. And this leads to some very interesting consequences. All right, thank you. Um, I think we have come to our final question already. Oh, okay. um, yeah, but um, perhaps uh, I have a personal question before mm. we finish off, and that mm. would be um, what in your mind um, would be the timeline towards mm. seeing some of these racetrack or skirmion type memories come to fruition? Oh, that's a very tough question to answer. But of course, um, we hope that it will be sooner rather than later. And I think it really, in the end, depends on convincing the mass manufacturers like Samsung, TSMC, uh, to make the investments that will be needed to demonstrate that you could reliably make billions of these racetracks. And I think that's the fundamental question. A lot of it then is driven by existing memory technologies that they're more familiar with. But as you find it's not possible to further increase the capacity of conventionally, you have to find something else if you really want to build, let's say, digital data storage systems with greater capacities. So it's really a question of um, how soon will these existing technologies no longer be improvable? And that's probably right now. So then it means that within a relatively short space of time, you will need alternative technologies that have superior uh, performances or the potential to go beyond. And I think this is what has happened. Like MRAM, it was, you know, it took a long time, but partly because existing technologies could be evolved. And since one is more familiar with them, you're more confident that you could evolve them. But today, I think with uh, the, the ending of scaling of many, many, many technologies, it means you have to do something new. And this huge opportunity then for Spintronic uh, 
devices which can scale to tiny dimensions or give you much greater performance with greater reliability. So huge opportunities. And I think this is the time when we will move from, you know, completely charge based to many more spin based uh, technologies, both for memory and even potentially for computing. Right. Really, thank you, uh, okay. thank you, um, Stuart, for this very inspirational talk. And uh, mm. we really enjoy um, this. And thank you, too, for bringing Spintronic to the mess, really. Okay, um, okay. thank you very yeah, much. And we really look forward to mm. some of these new ideas that you have coming to fruition. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thanks, thank everyone, you. for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much.